To do that, thank you. <laughs> to do that, um, I want you to hold... Well, I, first, I want you to see this as a journey. That's really it. I want you to see this as a journey. And any journey that we go on is often going to be very uplifting. It's going to be very naturally stimulating. It's going to be very uh, refreshing to our minds, our bodies, and our spirits, right? I think that's really important. And there's going to be times over these three days where we're going to experience that very easily and naturally and supernaturally. Um, I don't know. I, I, how many of you here like to go on cruises? Anyone here like to go on cruises? Raise your hand. Right? Okay. Good. Your pastor does, by the way. Hint, hint. He just raised his hand. Um, I do too. Now, I didn't think I was going to like going on cruises. Um, I thought I was going to be absolutely bored. But uh, about six years ago, my parents, for their 50th anniversary, they held the whole family hostage. And they said, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary on the cruise. Wouldn't it be good if you could come on the cruise too? Hint, hint. And so I sucked it up. And uh, my wife, myself, my daughter, we went on the cruise. And within 30 minutes of being on the ship, I was like, this is amazing. And I never want to go on vacation anywhere else, any way else, right? And, and really, except for the pandemic, we had a couple years where we just literally went on cruises every year. I loved it. Anyone here ever been to the Caribbean? Right? Amazing, right? Have you ever seen a sunset in the Caribbean? If you're on the back of a ship and you're, and you're, and you're sailing and you just see this sunset, it is powerfully um, uh, moving. And you know, when you're on a ship, you're up high generally, so you're even closer to the sun, right? And it is just stunning. It's so easy to feel God's presence and to be in that experience of beauty, to feel loved. And, um, and that's what journeys are like for us, right? They can really be times of great re restoration. And there's going to be times over these three days where we're going to experience that. But any journey worth its weight is also going to move us outside of our comfort zones. It's also going to, to push us to places that maybe we weren't sure we wanted to go. And um, for example, once I started going on cruises, I actually discovered that my wife and I, we, um, we cruise in entirely different ways. Right? For me, going on a cruise is an excuse to float on a pool that is in itself floating on the ocean, right? That's what I want to do. I want to read. When it gets hot, I want to swim. I want to get out and I want to dry off because the sun is hot. And then I want to swim again and read and nap and then eat, right? I mean, that's kind of what I want to do. And, um, but my wife, she wants to suck all of the adventure out of every moment on a cruise. And so the day is filling up. I wake up and she's like, okay, we're going to go over here. And then we've got this. And then there's this dance contest over here. And then if we're at port, forget about it. Right? Because we're in every excursion you can possibly go to. All I want to do is read and sleep and eat. And all of a sudden, I'm climbing waterfalls. And I'm driving all-terrain vehicles into jungles. And I'm swimming right, in, uh, with creatures that I shouldn't be swimming with. You know what I mean? Like I made a decision early on. I grew up in Long Island. I'm very, very close to the Atlantic Ocean. So I was always at the beach. I made a decision when I was 17 that I would never spend an extended amount of time in an environment where I wasn't the apex predator, right? <laughs> like that's really what I said. But when you go into the ocean, guess what? Everything swims faster than you. And so it's a problem. But here's the thing that I discovered that when I allowed myself to just sit with the discomfort, when I allowed myself to grumble but go, and be present to the experiences that my wife wanted to do, it transformed not only our relationship, but me. I discovered I could do things I never knew I could do, nor that I think I would ever want to do. And the same is true in the spiritual life. That when we are in a place of discomfort, when we are in a place even of suffering, if we can choose to be present in that moment to what is happening with us and invite the Lord into that place, those are the moments that he uses for incredible transformation. And so this is going to be a journey and there was going to bring us great comfort and it's going to move us outside of our comfort zone. And I don't generally know what those points are going to be. They might be different for everybody. I mean, I have a general idea. I've been doing this a while and I know when I'm about to throw grenades, right? 
But even so, sometimes people get mu like crazily, you know, out of their comfort zone and stuff I thought was pretty tame. And so that's what this journey is going to be. And I hope that you will remain with that discomfort, not shut down, and ask the Lord to be present in those moments. And we're going to take this like a, I want you to hold a paradox in your hand, okay, as we go on this journey. When Jesus sent out his disciples, do you remember he gave them instructions? What, what, what was one of the first instructions he gave them? Totally not a rhetorical question. <laughs> Someone whispered it. Don't take anything. Take nothing for the journey. And so as we go on this journey, I don't want you to take anything. I don't want you to take anything along. In other words, I don't want you to have any expectations about how God is going to move over these next three days. If God works in your life and, and communicates with you mostly in silence and contemplation, don't just expect, because that's the way he's dealt with you for your entire life, that over these three days, that's how he's going to reveal himself to you. And if you're used to hearing the voice of God, particularly in deep or um, tumultuous moments in your life, and, uh, and, there's, and there's drama, and there's the storm, and that's the way God communicates with you, don't just expect, don't have the expectation that that's how he's going to deal with you over the next three days. I used to do this. I had a very specific way I believed God moved, and for the first 26 years of my life, that's, I knew this is God, and this is how I know it's God, because it happens in this way. And anything else that didn't happen in that way, I was like, that clearly can't be from God. See, I put God in a box. And God is not a respecter of our boxes. And he sat me down one day and very literally said, I'm not sitting in this box anymore. And when he moved in that way, I recognized that there was about 10 years of my life that God was trying to reveal something to, to me about who he was. And I was too distracted to listen because it didn't look like I expected it to look. So have no expectation about how God is going to move, but here's the paradox. Expect that God is going to move. Expect that he's going to move. Why? Because that's what God wants to do. He wants to move in our lives. He wants to transform us. He wants us to experience his love. And so if we can hold that expectation that he's going to move, but not have an expectation about what that's going to look like, then we allow ourselves the freedom to be as open to God as possible during this journey. Does that make sense? You might be exhausted already. We haven't even started, right? All right, so let's begin. Buckle up, because I realized when I came over here, I forgot my notes. So um, this is just whatever the Holy Spirit's going to do right now. I want to share this story. Um, a number of years ago, when John Paul II visited Denver for World Youth Day, um, he got off the plane that took him to the United States, and he went to the limousine that was going to drive him everywhere, and he asked the limo driver if it would be possible if he could drive himself. And the limo driver, understanding the importance of the Holy Father, said, you know, Holy Father, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's a good idea. I know these roads and you don't. I should probably drive. But John Paul II was insistent. He pressed in. He said, you don't understand. You don't know how long it's been since I've been able to drive myself anywhere. And so I was hoping to experience that freedom here in the land of the free. And so, may I drive myself? And against his better judgment, the limo driver gave in. And so John Paul II and the limo driver exchanged places. And John Paul II is driving all along the highways and byways of Denver and enjoying himself. And maybe enjoying himself a little too much, because pretty soon a police cruiser pulls up behind the limousine, flashes its lights, and pulls the limo over. The police officer gets out of his car, goes up to the driver's side of the limo, indicates for the driver to roll the window down, and when the window goes down and the police officer can see inside the car, he immediately takes three steps back, gets on the phone, and calls his sergeant. And he says, Sarge, we have a problem. And the sergeant's like, well, what's up? And he says, well, I've pulled somebody over for speeding, but they're really important. And so the sergeant asks him, well, like, how important is this person, like, more important than the mayor? Without any hesitation, the police officer said, Sarge, way more important than the mayor. So the sergeant asks him again, well, how important is this person? Like, more important than the governor. Without any hesitation, the police officer says, Sarge, way more important than the governor. So the sergeant's starting to get a little nervous. He asks a third time, 
How important is this person, more important than the President of the United States? And the police officer thought about it for just a second and said, Sarge, way more important than the President of the United States. And so now the sergeant's in full-blown panic mode. He begins to shout at his officer, what have you done? How important is this person? Who have you pulled over? And so the police officer took one more look into the limousine and got back on the phone and said, Sarge, listen, I don't know who I've pulled over, but they have to be really important because the Pope is their driver. <laughs> that might be the highlight of this mission, just so you know. <laughs> Why do I share that story with you? Because the truth is, sometimes we find it very difficult to see who someone else really is. But brothers and sisters, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we find it difficult to discover, to see who we truly are, our deepest identity in Christ. Identity is a powerful concept. It's the essence of who someone is. And often as Catholics, we live our lives as if our identity is something wildly different than the one that God has actually given us. For many of us, we have a difficult time envisioning that there is a, a, a God who truly loves us and loves us enough not simply to give us rules to live and then send us on our way, but who is active in our lives, who is intimately involved, who desires us to experience love. For many of us, we have an image that God is vaguely angry all the time, maybe a little unsettled if not angry, but kind of waiting for us to mess up so that he can drop the hammer. Many of us labor under this wounded image of God so much that we think we have to be perfect in order for the Father to love us. That I've got to do everything I can do. I've got to be the perfect Catholic. I've got to be the perfect son or daughter. I have to be the perfect mom or dad. I have to be perfect at work. Otherwise, right, God's going to be upset. He's going to be disappointed. We labor sometimes under a, a performance model of our faith. That we have to perform in order to unlock God's goodness. That God is, he has to deal with us because he created us, but he really doesn't want to deal with us. And he'd rather that we just be quiet, that we do what we're told, and then everything will be fine. But if we mess up, now he's got to really spend some time with us. You know how difficult it is to learn to love a God who looks like that? A God that we don't even necessarily believe wants to be in relationship with us, but has to be in relationship. A God who somehow created us and created the world and says, okay, good luck. Right? Try to muscle your way through this on your own willpower, and I hope you can hold on long enough to squeak into purgatory. I travel all over the world, and I, and I talk to Catholics of, of sort of every socioeconomic background, of every ethnicity, and there's a common theme that people feel like the father is somehow angry all the time. It's like he's a grumpy old guy in the neighborhood always yelling at the kids to get off his lawn. And Jesus somehow like sneaks around the back gate and says, Psst, hey, come this way. Right? The old man is sleeping. He'll never know you're here. As if Jesus is somehow a loophole around the Father's judgment and anger. And so I want to break this open because if we want to live a life of abundance, if we want to live a life of fullness, if we want to live a life rooted in the kingdom of God, then we must truly know who we are and we can only know who we are if we have a deep understanding of who God is. And the beautiful thing is, even though God is a mystery, He's revealed Himself to us. He's told us about Himself in the Scriptures. He showed us what it's like to live in the kingdom in Jesus. And so I want to meditate. I want to break open this reality of, of the Father's delight. Have you ever thought about this for a moment? What if the Father delighted in you? See, we talk about God as love. And we use that phrase so often that it, ce it ceases to have revolutionary power. Yeah, God is love. You believe God is love? Yeah, God is love. And then we just go on our, uh, about our day. But there's a, that's a revolutionary phrase, that God is love. And so I want to unpack that a little bit 
and, and show you how truly life-changing those three words can be. I grew up, I'm a child, I like to say I'm a child of the 60s, okay? I grew up uh, October 1969, that's when I was born. My summer of love was wildly different than other people's summer of love, right? And um, I grew up, I had my religious formation in the 70s. And so I learned some amazing things, including God is love. But I wouldn't characterize my religious formation as rigorous, right? We, we spent a lot of time cutting things out of magazines and making mobiles of doves, right? And I, like, memory is tied to the olfactory sense. And as I'm telling you about what we did in CCD, remember, that's what we called it back in the day, right? I'm smelling glue right now, right? And that's just the reality. And so we learned that God is love, but I don't think I ever really tracked it. Yeah, yeah, God is love. If God truly is love, and that's his nature, if God truly is love and that's his nature, then you and I, who are made in the image and likeness of God, we are by our very natures the ones who are loved by God. That's in our nature, before our actions, before our activities, before all of the things that we do. Our very nature is beloved. Think about that. There is nothing that you and I can do that can change the Father's heart for us. I need you to hear that. There are people here today who are carrying that burden. I can feel it. Felt it as I walked in. There is nothing that you and I can do to change the Father's heart for us. Why is that? Because God is God, and for God to be God, he has to be unchanging. And if you and I could somehow convince God to love us more by our actions and our activities, somehow God would have changed. And he can't. See, God loves us as much on the days when we are furthest from his love as he does on the days when we are closest and most united with him. Because God's love right, is never ending and never changing. God's love is never ending and never changing. There is nothing that you and I can do to change the Father's heart for us. I'm going to give you a very Catholic context for that, and I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm actually saying, not what you think I'm saying. I've done this enough to know that if I don't call this out, someone's going to come up afterwards and say, I can't believe you said this. And I'm like, oh, I never said that. So I want you to listen to this. There's nothing that you and I can do to change the Father's heart for us. That means that there's no amount of daily mass, there's no amount of praying the rosary, there's no amount of scripture study, there's no amount of almsgiving, there's no amount of prayer, there's no amount of, um, of doing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy that will change the Father's heart for us. And I need you to hear that. Because we operate as if God has to let us into heaven if we do Catholic things. And it's not cause and effect like that. Here's what I'm not saying, brothers and sisters, okay? Because the bishop is here, okay? Here's what I'm not saying. I, am, I would say this even if the bishop wasn't here. I am not saying don't go to daily mass. I'm not saying the rosary isn't a powerful devotion. I'm not saying that scripture study is unimportant or that living the corporal and spiritual works of mercy is really not a part of being a Catholic. I'm not saying any of those things, but I hope you hear me. What I am saying is that none of those things change the Father's heart for us. All of those things change our heart for the Father. All of those things allow the very grace of God, which is poured out for us so that we might be united with Him, it allows that grace to touch us and transform us and open our hearts so that we can receive the love which we were created to receive. To receive the love that God has been waiting for us to receive. But none of those things make God love us any more than He already does. We have to jettison that performance mentality. That's the radical nature of the statement, God is love. Let me give you uh, something concrete. My daughter, when she was born, she was a big girl. She was 10 pounds, 5 ounces. Yeah, I know. There's always a quiet, all the women go, ooh. <laughs> and all the guys go, what? <laughs> Just push, right? My, my wife, like, we wanted an all, I say we, my wife wanted an all-natural childbirth, right? And so she labored for 22 hours. Yeah, ooh. 
again, right? <laughs> and then hour after hour, there was like, oh, medical intervention, medical intervention, medical intervention, until finally she needed a C-section because my daughter was like a sumo wrestler coming out. Now, I didn't recognize that there was anything wrong when my, I saw my daughter for the first time. Right? I didn't recognize there was, there was anything abnormal. Um, uh, so I texted, I took a picture of my daughter and I texted my parents and they lived in Florida, right, because we, I grew up in Long Island and the law is when you retire in Long Island, you have to move to Florida. My, my parents are the Costanzas from Seinfeld, if you've ever seen that show. And so I texted my, my mom and dad and I said, I said, Mom, congratulations, here's the, the birth of your first granddaughter. And my mom texted back a few minutes later and said, Keith, congratulations on the birth of your toddler. <laughs> and I was like, what? Until I wheeled my daughter into the nursery, right, where I saw her next to the normal sized children, right, the five, six, seven pound kids. And I thought, oh my gosh, my daughter could eat these children. <laughs> and she practically did, right, because she came out looking for food. She almost asked for it. She was a big girl, but I remember, like when my wife knew that she had conceived, and I know it's popular nowadays to say, you know, we conceived, and yes, I obviously was a part of that process, but my wife did most of the hard work over nine months. When my wife discovered that she had conceived, I knew I was a dad. And my wife and I began, from the moment we, we saw the pregnancy test, um, we began to pray over my daughter in my wife's womb. And we began to pray over her every night. She, ha she was forced to listen to classical music in utero, and also we read the four Gospels to her. And I know in the third trimester in particular, my daughter's favorite Gospel was the Gospel of John, because every time we would read it, she would just move. It was amazing. So I knew I was a dad, but there was a moment when I saw my daughter bundled up, right, in that, I don't know, holly hobby oven thing, that, the, whatever that thing is that keeps the babies warm. I looked down and my heart was filled with a love I had never experienced before. And I loved my daughter, not because of all of the gifts that she had been given. I didn't even know what she could do. Right? She was just kind of sitting there drooling at the moment. And I loved my daughter, not because of all the ways she would be obedient to her mom and I, because I had no idea. And frankly, now that she's 11, right, we have to parent my daughter with holy water, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Right, we got to splash the devil right out of there. <laughs> it's crazy. And I loved my daughter before I ever knew anything she would ever accomplish in her life. You see, brothers and sisters, I loved my daughter simply because she was mine. And the love of a father and the love of a mother come to us from our Heavenly Father. And if we love our children simply because they're ours, how much more does our Heavenly Father love us simply because we're His? Not because of how Catholic we are. Not because of all the good things that we're going to do. Now, is it unimportant to live a good Catholic life? No, I'm not saying that. But we have to recognize that we need to disconnect any wounded image of God that says, I've got to do these things so that the Father will love me so that he will uh, pour his heart out, so that he won't send me to hell, right? We really need to shift our understanding of the identity of God. God is love. Do you understand? God didn't create us because he lacked something. I'm already way behind schedule. God didn't, God didn't create us because he lacked something, right? God wasn't bored. The Father wasn't bored in eternity, right? He wasn't sitting around going, man, this is terrible. In eternity, every day is like the, the day after and before. And the Word of God is here, and he's always, He always listens to me. And the Holy Ghost is just floating around somewhere, right? This is really boring. I know I'm going to create humans. And if I create them, they're going to have to worship me, and then things are going to get interesting. Right? That's not why God created us. He wasn't missing something. God didn't create us out of a lack of something. He created us out of an abundance of something. An abundance of love, which is the very nature of God. God is love. And God is love. And that love is so immense. It's so powerful that it cannot be contained in a single person. And so the Father offers everything to the Son, even the depths of His own being. And the Son, out of love and fidelity to the Father, offers everything back to the Father, even His own life. And in that eternal exchange of self between Father and Son, which has 
no beginning and will have no end, another person is present, the Holy Spirit, who is the love between the Father and the Son. And so God creates us, not because he lacks something, but because he is something. He is love, and love always seeks the beloved. Love always goes out of itself for the sake of the other. And this is important for us to recognize. Like, sin turns inward. Right? That's why my image of Satan isn't some dude in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork and hooves and a tail. My image of Satan is actually a black hole. Because what's a black hole? I don't know much about science, right? I have multiple degrees in anything but science. But what is a black hole? But really, uh, a neutron star, which has become so dense and turned inward that it collapses in on itself. And as it collapses in on itself, it punches a hole in the universe. And then that hole sucks out of the universe light and gravity and matter. And so Satan is like a black hole in creation. He's turned inward on himself so much that he has become that black hole and he seeks to, to, to suck out light and love and goodness. But God isn't like that at all. He creates out of an abundance of love. And therefore, he creates us to experience love. Because the Father knows that the greatest experience any creature could ever have is to be loved perfectly by the one who created them. And that's the whole reason for our creation, brothers and sisters, so that we would receive love, so that we would share love. That's why the Catechism says that the fundamental human vocation is to love. Relationship is a feature of creation, not a bug. It's not something that God has to deal with, but in fact, the whole reason for creation. God created everything that is, from the smallest subatomic particle to the densest neutron star. He set all of the planets spinning around all of the stars and all of the galaxies, simply so that you and I would have a place to live and move and have our being, because we're not like the angels who are pure spirits. And we're not like the animals who are pure matter. You and I are embodied spirits. We are body and soul in union. And matter matters. It's not accidental, right? The world says, right, our modern culture says, you know what, your body is just a piece of meat and you can do whatever you want with it. The real self is somewhere inside. And sometimes we get caught in that trap of thinking that way, but that's not Catholic, a Catholic way of thinking. John Paul II would say it this way, that we cannot say that the human person has a body. We must say that the human person is a body. Because bodiliness is an essential part of our identity. And so God creates everything so that there can be a history of love between God and his creature. You and I are the only part of creation that God creates simply because. Every other part of creation God creates so that we can be in relationship with him and with each other. Relationship is written into our very being, right? We're made in the image and likeness of God. And God, as we've already said, is three persons in one being. The theological way of, of expressing that is to say that God is a communion of persons. You don't have to remember that. Re remember this. God is relationship. And if you and I are made in the image of likeness of God, then that means that you and I were created for relationship. We were created for intimacy. We were created for communion, both with God and with each other. In fact, that's why we're created male and female. Those, that's not an accidental biological distinction. It's written into God's very plan. God writes the capacity for union within our very bodies because we are created with a hunger. Every human person is created with a hunger to know and to be known by someone else, to love and to be loved by someone else. It's written into our very bodies. And when we don't find and experience the love for which we were created, we try to fill it up with other things. And sometimes those things are sinful. But sometimes those things can be good. But we misuse them. We mistake the creation for the creator. It becomes our idols, right? We want to be fulfilled by something. But you and I were not created for things of this world, but for the love of the Father. I hope you're hearing this. Right? God wants to be in relationship. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. I would tell you to open up your Bibles, um, but that's okay. This is a Catholic mission. I got it, right? By the way, though, if you have a smartphone, 
you have access to a Bible. So always remember that. If you're gonna, if you're gonna Google the Bible, I want you to Google this, whatever it is, like Book of John, Book of Jeremiah, do like Jeremiah um, chapter one, N-A-B, N-A-B, okay? The New American Bible, that's the translation we use at Liturgy. And it'll come up to the USCCB website, you can click right on it. Do so you have access to it? Jeremiah chapter one, verse five. Before I formed you in the womb, What's the, the last part of that phrase? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. See, you all know it, right? That's another revolutionary statement that we sometimes don't even track. Because the knowledge of God is deep and intimate knowledge. You understand that? The knowledge of God is different than our knowledge. I'll give you an example. This is the part of the mission where the people who sit in the back go, Oh, I shouldn't have sat in the back. <laughs> so I won't pick on anyone up front. I, just, I want to be random. I, I can feel tension right here. I can feel it. How are you? Good. All right. Excellent. What's your name? David. David, David I'm Keith. Very nice to meet you. All right, David, um, do you have a favorite movie? You have no favorite movies. That's okay. That's fine. Do you have a favorite genre of music? 70s or 80s. Okay. Wonderful. Excellent. It's David, right? Beautiful. All right. Listen. I, everyone, I want you to meet my good friend David. We go back seconds, he and I. We have been through a lot together, David. We have. It's been tense. We've had some tense moments, but I know you got my back. Right? David doesn't really know if he has a favorite movie. He probably does, but can't think of it in the moment, right? Uh, because he's a little flabbergasted that I picked him. But he loves 70s and 80s music, right? He loves the Allman Brothers in particular. I could tell that about him right now, right? I just know. Now, I know David. But that knowledge isn't deep. It's the knowledge of an acquaintance. God's knowledge is deep. It penetrates to the heart. See, that word knowledge, to know, in biblical terms, it reflects this deep intimacy. In fact, it stands in for something else often in Scripture. Do you know what it stands in for? What does it mean to know someone in a biblical sense? Some of you might know it and you're too embarrassed to say it because the bishop is here, right? It stands in for the marital act. Do you know what I mean by the marital act? Some of you are shaking your head, some of you don't know. <laughs> We've got a lot of mixed company here. You get the point. Intimacy. Intimacy, union. That's why Mary, when the angel Gabriel came to her, and the angel Gabriel said, hey, you're gonna be the mother of the Messiah, before Mary said, yes, of course, she actually said this, how could this be? Because I do not know a man, even though she was already betrothed to Joseph. So clearly she knew a man, but she didn't have deep, intimate knowledge of a man. So when scripture says that the Lord tells the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. What the Lord is saying there is before you were even conceived in your mother's womb, I had deep and intimate knowledge of you. I knew what would, fulfill, would fill your heart with joy. I knew what would bring you fulfillment. I knew what would move you in the face of injustice. I know everything about you before you're even conceived. Now that's radical if you think about it. I mean, this is an imperfect understanding, but it's almost as if we could say God couldn't wait to be in relationship with us. And that's why this isn't biblical. It's probably not even good philosophy. But I can't help but think of this image that at the moment of your conception, how the Father must have danced with joy and said, at last, you're here. I have waited for you from before time began. And now you're here. And now you can receive my love. And now you can share my love. I am so happy that you're here. Think about that. And scripture tells us very clearly that everything that is created is held into being by God. I think it's Colossians, right? All things, right? All things are held together in him, in the word. That means that if God forgot about any of us, even for a nanosecond, it wouldn't be like our friends would go, uh, hey, where did, where did Dave go, right? They would actually not even know that we ever existed. And that's why, brothers and sisters, when we talk about the goodness of God and we talk about the desire for, for God, for us to be in relationship with Him and to receive His love, we have to recognize that every heartbeat 
that we experience in this life, every breath that we take in this life and every moment in eternity is a moment where God is gazing upon us and holding us in the palm of his hand and saying, I choose you. This is the beginning of the message of the gospel. That we don't have to earn the love of the Father. That it is freely given us. That God desires that we would be in union with him. So that we could learn what it means to love, to be transformed, to be set free, to be set ablaze, to be set on fire. Think about that in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus said, I have come to set fire to the earth, and oh, how I wish it were already ablaze. That men and women would know their identity, to know that they are cherished by the Father. They are cherished by the one who created them, who calls them into deeper union. This is the goal. You understand the goal of the spiritual life, right? The goal of the spiritual life is union with God. But when we don't even know who God is, we don't have a clear sense of of our Heavenly Father, we don't have a sense of who we are. And so we think, gosh, well, I couldn't really think about that. I'll give you an example. We'll just take an informal poll. The bishop's here, but he's deep in um, infused contemplation right now, so you don't have to worry about it, okay? Um, How many people want to get to heaven? Raise your hand. How many people want to be in heaven? Okay. Amazing. Excellent. Father Rick, um, not everybody's raising their hand, Father Rick, so you, there's some work that needs to be done. Okay. Awesome. I took things. Okay, good, good. Yeah, the bishop was in contemplation, but Father Rick is taking notes. That's awesome. It's about 99.5% of you. Great. How many of you want to be saints? Raise your hand. We have a problem, brothers and sisters. Because almost all of you want to be in heaven, but only a third of you want to be saints. I have some bad news. The only people in heaven with God are saints. Why do you want to be in heaven but not be a saint? Could it be that somehow we think it's even arrogant to think that we could become saints? It's not not proper for a Catholic to talk about that. Right? Because God really wants us to be saints, but mm, only some of us are going to be because we kind of think that there are two tracks in Catholicism, right? There's the saints and everybody else, right? And we know that the saints are people that will never become, right? Because somehow we believe that God gave extra grace to the saints, right? I believe me, I used to believe the same thing. You know the story of St. Lawrence? Amazing, uh, amazing uh, guy, right? Uh, he, was, he was held captive and he was tortured, Okay, he was literally grilled alive. He was grilled alive. And he famously said to his captors, turn me over, I'm done on that side. Right? Honestly. Now, here's what I would have said. Ah! Stop! Right? Flannery O'Connor, who's a wonderful writer in the 20th century, she said this. She said she thought that she could be a martyr if they killed her quickly. Right? And I, I, I hold to the same philosophy. Right? If it's going to be quick, I got a shot. If it gets dragged out like St. Lawrence, I don't know. And so when I was growing up and I heard the story of St. Lawrence, I was like, ooh, right? Clearly, I'm never going to be St. Lawrence. I'm never going to be a saint. If that's what it takes to be a saint, that's not me. And I shouldn't even think about it. But brothers and sisters, here's the truth. You and I have already received all of the grace necessary to become a saint. And the only thing that's missing is our desire to cooperate with it. That's the only thing that's missing. And even that requires the grace of God, which he pours out for us. And so we have to recognize, if we don't believe that God is actively and intimately involved in our lives and he's created us for union and communion and intimacy, then why would we think we should be saints? Right? It's good enough for us to just squeak into purgatory. Right? Just because we feel like we've got to muscle through this on our own. And brothers and sisters, we don't. The goodness of God, the love of God, the intimacy for which we were created. Jesus talks about that in Scripture over and over again. And he calls it the rea- that reality the kingdom of God. And Jesus talks about the kingdom of God 144 times in Scripture. 144 times. It's pretty important. When Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about this experience of intimacy with, with, for which we were created. I want you to remember this scripture passage. We're going to refer back to it a couple of times. Romans chapter 14, 
Verse 17. The kingdom of God is neither meat nor drink. In other words, it's not simply of this world. The kingdom of God is neither meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know what righteousness is, brothers and sisters? Righteousness means right relationship with God. Righteousness means intimacy, communion, integrity, wholeness, healing, fullness, abundance, mercy. And then peace, a peace that the world doesn't give and therefore the world cannot take away. And a joy, a joy that is rooted in the persons of God. Right? Is rooted in the kingdom. And therefore, nothing on this earth can conquer that joy. Which is why the saints could suffer with great joy. The kingdom of God is neither meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The reality of the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters, is found in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's right there in Scripture. Now, when do we as Catholics, when did we first receive the Holy Spirit? Baptism. Praise God. How many people here are baptized? Raise their hands. Praise God. Awesome. Not every hand's raised either. That's okay. Uh, we've got water. Uh, we can take care of it. We have a number of clergy here. I don't want to short circuit the RCIA process, however. Awesome. That means that you and I have already received the reality of the kingdom of God. And what do we need now? But we need the grace to cooperate with it. We need to say, yes, I accept it. We need to dispose our lives so that the love of the Father can take root in us. We expect too little of God. We think He's just left us on our own. And there's so much that He has to pour out on us in the normal and natural ways of life and in the supernatural reality of the kingdom. You understand that life in Christ is supernatural life. It's literally above nature. Why? Because it is oriented toward eternity. It's oriented toward the kingdom. It's oriented toward the reality of God. It brings the natural to perfection, but it transcends the natural. It isn't simply of the natural order, which is why we call it supernatural. You, right, belong to a mystical body. You have been grafted into the body of Christ supernaturally. Three things have to happen. For someone to be grafted fully into the body of Christ. Three things. You know what those three things are? They're sacraments. Which three sacraments? Baptism, Eucharist, Confirmation. Those are supernatural actions of God on us. We belong to a supernaturally constituted community. And yet, here's the reality, brothers and sisters. Most Catholics are the least supernaturally minded people that I've ever met. I'm going to sort of try to end this night of the mission with a story. But before I can share the story, I have to give you some context, okay? I want you to keep in mind this kind of supernatural reality of life in Christ. How many of you, and don't just, because you've got pastors here, don't be worried. But how many of you believe that at every validly celebrated Mass, bread and wine become the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ? Just raise your hand. I'm not even looking. No judgment. Okay? All right. I believe it too. Fundamentally, with my whole being, I believe it. But do you not understand that the belief that something becomes someone, that bread becomes the Lord of the universe, is on a scale of 1 to 10, and that scale is the crazy scale, it's a 15. Do you understand? It's radical. It's out there. But here's the problem that we have, brothers and sisters. Catholics who profess to believe the 15, and I mean really believe the 15, have a hard time believing things that are less crazy. That the God who created us for relationship might want to remove all of the obstacles in our life to that relationship, beginning with sin but not ending there. Also including things like anger, and fear, anxiety, self-hatred, self-condemnation, addiction, that God wants to move in the broken places of our lives and bring them to a place of healing and transformation. But Catholics who profess to believe the 15 have a hard time believing something that's way less crazy. That's like a six at best. He created us for a relationship. Why wouldn't he want to remove all of the obstacles? In fact, that's why he sent his son Jesus. So Catholics who profess to believe a 15 have a hard time believing things that are less crazy, like the fact that the God who created us for relationship might want to speak to us. Not simply through 
scripture, not simply through the liturgy, not simply through other people, not simply through the history of the world, but in the depths of our own hearts that the Lord God speaks, that God deals with each of his children intimately. What father who is a good father ignores their children? And Jesus even says in scripture, I'm the good shepherd and the sheep know my voice. And the sheep can only know the voice of the good shepherd if the good shepherd is speaking to the sheep. Right? Jesus is the word of God. Literally, right? The word of God spoken out of the mouth of the father. Jesus is never silent even when his language is silence. Jesus is always revealing the love of the father. And he speaks in the depths of our hearts. But Catholics who believe the 15 have a hard time believing that. Well, he speaks to people, but the saints. He speaks to people, but the holy people. He speaks to people, but not me, because I've done this, I've thought this, this has happened to me in my life. He couldn't possibly speak to me. My community, where I was um, uh, um, the director of evangelization and discipleship at a parish in the northwest suburbs, when I first got there for the first six months, they all looked at me like I was crazy, like some of you are looking at me right now. And I went to a friend of mine in the community and I said, what's going on? And she said, oh, Keith, you talk funny. And I thought I hadn't gotten rid of my accent. Like literally, I thought that's what, that was what it was because I still put spoons in the kitchen drawer, right? You understand? And, and sometimes when I'm really um, tired, I might ask for a glass of water. And if I'm really tired, I might want to ask you a question. Right? That just happens. And she goes, no, it's not that. I go, then what is it? She says, you basically, you, 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 you say things like, well, when you were in prayer last week, God revealed this to you. Or when you were praying, the Holy Spirit showed you this. She said, Keith, you act as if God speaks to you. And honestly, I don't have a good filter even on the best of days, and I didn't have a good day that day. And so I literally, when she said, you act as if God speaks to you, I was like, what, he doesn't speak to you? Because of course, brothers and sisters, he does. We have to learn how to listen, but God is speaking. So Catholics who profess to believe the 15 have a hard time believing things that are less crazy. Like the God who created the body might want to heal the body. Think about that for a second, right? The God who created the body might want to heal the body. Catholics who profess to believe the 15 have a hard time believing that. That's one of the hardest things that we have to believe. So when we pray for people who are sick, what do we do normally when it's not the anointing of the sick? How do we often pray for people? If they have to go to the hospital, we say, Lord, please guide the hands of the surgeons or please guide the hands of the doctors. And those are beautiful prayers. Pray those prayers. If I have to go into for surgery, pray those prayers. Okay, because I don't want the surgeon to sneeze as he's cutting me open and I have the mark of Zorro on my chest for the rest of my life, right? I don't want that. So pray that way, but how come we don't also pray, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we command all dysfunction in this body to be completely healed? Pain leave in Jesus' name. Why don't we pray that way, brothers and sisters? Often we don't pray that way because, frankly, we don't believe God's actually going to do it. Even though, if you look at Scripture and tradition and the lived history of the church, you see it over and over and over and over again. But we don't believe that, we're, that he's going to do it, so we don't pray that way. Now, I'm not suggesting if we did pray that way, God's going to physically heal everybody. There's a mystery to suffering. There's a, there's a mystery to the sovereign moves of God. I don't understand it completely. But I do know this, that any time we come to the Lord with any degree of openness... Right? Any degree of openness, God always does something. We always receive something. Sometimes God heals our hearts. And that changes our whole experience of suffering. On Wednesday, I'm going to share a little bit of my own life story. Right? I grew up without a hand, and it was not generally a positive experience. I hated myself. I hated my parents. I hated God. And it's only through the grace of God that I'm actually standing before you today because I probably wouldn't be alive if I didn't encounter the love of the Father. Now, when I had that encounter with the love of the Father in Jesus, and I came up from that encounter, I was still missing my hand. But God had brought a deep healing into my own heart, and my whole experience of living with a disability shifted and changed in 45 minutes. Sometimes God heals our hearts, and that changes our whole experience of suffering. Again, why the saints could suffer with great joy. Sometimes God heals the suffering. He brings healing, and that changes our hearts. Sometimes he does both. 
Sometimes we come to God needing one thing, and he heals something else. We didn't even realize we needed healing. So the wrong question to ask, brothers and sisters, whenever we come to God for healing is, did God heal me? That's the wrong question to ask. Why? Because God's very nature is to heal. That's why the Jewish people called him Jehovah Rapha, the, the God who heals. And that's that, that word, Hebrew word uh, Rapha, is the root word for Raphael, the name Raphael. And we have a Saint Raphael in the church, right? And what's, what's he the patron saint of? Healing. Healing. By the way, I love being Catholic because we're, we are like macabre in the best possible way. Because remember I talked about Saint Lawrence? being grilled alive, he's the patron saint of barbecue. And I'm not even lying. I'm not even lying. Look it up. The wrong question to ask is, did God heal us? The right question to ask is, what in my life is God bringing to healing in this moment? And God calls us together so that we can help one another recognize where he is moving and where he's bringing healing. So I'm not suggesting that if we pray that way, God's going to heal everybody physically. But what I am suggesting, brothers and sisters, is that you and I stop deciding for God what he is and isn't going to do. Because when we pray, we don't pray in that way. What we're really saying is, you don't work that way. And there's this, there's this beautiful uh, phrase in theology, right? The, the law of prayer is the law of belief. Do you want to know what the church believes? Listen to how she prays. Do you want to know what the people of God believe? Listen to how we pray. And when we don't pray that way, what we really say is we don't believe God's going to move. But yet we believe that bread becomes the Lord of the universe, which is a 15. And so I, I haven't even gotten to my story yet, you understand, right? I'm setting the stage. So I want you to recognize that this is the crazy thing that we believe in, and we have a hard time believing things that are less crazy. But brothers and sisters, if you are willing to believe that bread becomes the Lord of the universe then how dare we disbelieve anything else that flows from that reality and that is seen in scripture and tradition and the lived history of the church. You cannot. We are so, uh, so off, uh, off um, the word is, so, I'm, like, I'm having a moment. <laughs> often, that's the word. So often we talk about the church and saying there's no, there's no such thing as cafeteria Catholicism. You can't pick and choose. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? You can't pick and choose. You can't say, I believe the 15, but I don't believe the 7. If they flow together, if they're part of the tradition of the church and part of scripture, we can't. And so I'm going to share a story with you as we end tonight. And I'm going to be really honest with you, right? Nothing that I share with you in this story in the next 11 minutes is going to be crazier than your belief in the Eucharist. And so to remind you, if I start talking and all of a sudden I hear, I, I see from you like, hmm. Right, what is he talking about? I'm just going to say the word Eucharist. I'm going to point to the tabernacle. And you'll know that your belief in the Eucharist is crazier than the story I'm about to share. Okay? Buckle up. Here we go. I talked about how God wants to move in the normal and the everyday and how God also desires to pour out his love in supernatural ways. That's why we have the sacraments, right? We are a supernaturally constituted community. And when you live in your identity as a son or a daughter of God, one who is beloved, God desires that we share that love with the world. And I was um, sent out to um, a parish in Texas. I don't know if you've ever been to Texas. You know what they say, everything's bigger in Texas, right? Well, I mean, honestly, this parish was huge. It was about, I think, 6,800 families or 7,300 families, something like that. Um, they had their, their church sat 2,000, and they had 11 masses, which were mostly full, right? You go to church there, you go to church with 22,000 of your closest friends, right? It was big. I did a, uh, I did a staff retreat, and then I did something uh, for their volunteers. And they had Spanish-speaking volunteers, and there were about like 600 of them. And then I, did, I worked with the English-speaking volunteers, and there were about 500 of them. And it was, an, it was an incredible experience. But as I'm flying down, over and down, I'm praying the liturgy of the hours on the, on the plane. I'm praying on the plane. But I had asked my friend, right, if we could go to eat somewhere. Because I, I like food. You understand, right? You don't get a body like mine without working at it. <laughs> I like food. And I wanted authentic Tex-Mex food. I want, I'm just going there. I want authentic Tex-Mex food. Right? And so as I'm praying, and I'm, I'm a man, so ladies, you understand, I don't multitask well. Right? So I'm praying and drooling because I'm thinking about dinner while I'm praying to the Lord. And somewhere during that prayer, 
the Lord was very clear that he wanted me to go somewhere very specific for dinner. If that sounds crazy to you, I just want to point you toward Jesus in the tabernacle. You believe that bread becomes the Lord of the universe. That's way crazier than God speaking to his people. He does that all the time in history and in our tradition. And so, as always, when these things happen, I argue. I argue with God. Why do I argue with God? Because I want to serve God, but in an advisory capacity, right? <laughs> I kind of want to tell him, these are the things that you should do. I lost the argument and ended up um, finishing the prayer. We landed. My friend Kurt, who hired me, came to pick me up. And he's like, okay, are you ready? I'm like, I am ready. I said, but there's been a little bit, uh, something's just happened. He goes, what? I said, well, while I was praying, the Lord said that he wanted us to go somewhere very specific for dinner. And Kurt was like, what? I go, yes. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you know how we wanted authentic Tex-Mex food? And he's like, yeah. I said, okay, well, uh, the, Lord, the Lord wants us to go to um, Chili's. <laughs> you see why I was mad? I wanted like brisket that was going to melt in my mouth, eaten out of paper plates, right, in some dude's backyard. But instead, I'm going to Chili's. He goes, well, uh, which one? And I'm like, I have no idea. But if this really is from God, he's going to have to figure it out. So let's just go to the nearest one. And so we drove to the nearest one. We, as we got in, the hostess took us to our table. And as we were walking to our table, I heard the Lord say very clearly, I'm about to do something. Now, if that sounds crazy to you, remember, you believe that Jesus is present in that tabernacle under the appearance of bread. And so I, said, I turned to my friend Kurt and I said, Kurt, this is going to be the best dinner we've ever had. And he's like, why? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. But God's up to something. And pretty soon our server came out. She was about 20. Um, and as she came over, all of a sudden, as she was walking over, I had the strongest sense that she played volleyball. I heard the word volleyball in my head. I saw a volleyball court, like it just sort of popped up in my mind's eye, and it kept appearing. And I was like, oh, this is weird, Lord, is this from you? And it continued, if this sounds crazy, you believe in the Eucharist. I mean, I believe it too, but that's crazy. And so I just said to her, because believe it or not, I don't try to be the Jesus freak everywhere I go. Right? I, sometimes I just want to eat dinner. I just want to, I want to play computer games. I want to watch television. Right? But I was like, well, I got to do this. And so I asked her as she took our or drink order, I said, listen, by any, is, there, is there any chance that you play volleyball? And she said, yeah, why? And I was like, no reason. Because <laughs> I'm like, what am I going to do now? Right? I don't know. So Kurt's looking at me weird, but he... She goes to get our drink, she comes back, and as she comes back to take our appetizer order, now I have the strongest sense that she has a major decision that she needs to make in her life in about two weeks, but God wants to be a part of it. Again, if that sounds strange, I just want to point you to the tabernacle. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to say this now, and if it's weird, it's okay, because I'm leaving Texas in a couple days, right? It's not going to be, the FBI won't get involved, it'll be fine. And so I just said to her, listen, I don't know if this makes any sense, so, but I, I just have a feeling that you have a major decision in your life that's coming up in like two weeks. And I want you to know that God really wants to be a part of that decision. I said, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. And she looked at me, and she's kind of funny, but she said, yeah, that makes sense. And she never told me what her decision was, but she started talking about her life. She was raised an evangelical Protestant, and uh, she was in college, and her faith has sort of been dying down. And so uh, she talked to me about that. She didn't tell me what the decision was, but there was a decision, and she said, thank you. And so she took our appetizer order, walked away, and when she came back to take our main order, as she was walking, and I'm not Sherlock Holmes, but as she was walking up, um, the Lord was very clear that she had hurt her knee, and he was very specific. It was her left knee. Now, she wasn't wearing a brace. She was wearing jeans. She didn't walk with a limp, right? I'm not Sherlock Holmes. I can't detect the subtle difference in stance, right? And so when she came up, at this point, I was kind of feeling emboldened. So I was like, hey, can you tell me what happened to your knee? And she looked at me and said, what? I said, your knee, what happened to your knee? She just looked at me again like, what? I said, your left knee, what did you do? And she turned white as a ghost. And she said, she looked at me weird, and she said, well, listen. 
She goes, I tore the meniscus in my left knee playing volleyball. And some days it hurts more than others, and it's really, really bothering me today. And so I said, I tell you what, after dinner, can we pray for your knee? And she's like, uh. <laughs> now, I kind of thought she would say yes, because she probably wanted a good tip. You know what I mean? And so she goes, yeah, I guess so. I said, OK, good. And so she left after she took our order. Now, my friend Kurt has been stone-faced this whole time, <laughs> just like this. And he's like, what are you doing as soon as she leaves? I go, what do you mean, what am I doing? We're going we're gonna to pray. Where are we going to pray? So we're going to pray in the back over there, right? There's an empty table right there. There's people around. I said, yes, it's OK, right? This is a restaurant. Sometimes there's people. But he's a good Catholic, do you understand? We don't pray in public, right? How many of you, when you go to the restaurant, do you make the sign of the cross before your meal? Raise your hand if you do that, right? Praise God. Now, how many of you do this? In the name of the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Bless the Lord, and he's like, and boom, right? Like, it's like you're running an auction. Don't do that. Make the sign of the cross. You don't have to stand up and go, <clears throat> in the name of the Father. Don't do that either. Make the sign of the cross. Pray in public. He didn't like, Kurt didn't want to pray in public. So as we're talking about the event and our dinner's coming, he's, I notice he's like nursing his dinner. He's taking the smallest bites possible. <laughs> he doesn't want to pray. But he runs out of food. And so it's time to, to pray. And I just called our server over. And I'm like, can we, can we pray now? And she's like, yeah, I guess so. I said, how about over there? And she's like, sure. And so Kurt's like, OK. So we get up and go. Now, brothers and sisters, here's what happens. As we're walking to that table where we're going to pray for that woman, the, the, the father starts revealing his heart for this young person, just pouring out his heart about his love for her. And he begins to reveal that her father has been addicted to drugs almost her whole life and has kicked his addiction and is now trying to reestablish relationship. If that sounds strange to you, Honestly, and I, don't, I know it's funny, but also you believe that bread becomes the Lord of the universe. So why would we have a difficult time with this? Think about it. So I didn't know what to do with that. So when we, she sat down, I said, okay, um, before we pray for your knee, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your father? Right? I felt like Sigmund Freud. I even had a goatee at the time, so I think I might have been like, tell me about your dad. And so she confirmed everything that the Lord had revealed. And I said, before we pray for your knee, can we pray for your father? And she said, sure. And the Holy Spirit was so gentle and loving, and it was just such a profoundly intimate experience. He brought this young woman great healing. And then we started to pray for her knee. Now, when we pray for her knee, like I was formed to pray for people in a very particular way. Often when Catholics pray, let me give you an example. Okay, of how often we pray, if, if we decide to pray for healing for somebody. This is a person right here. You can clearly see they need healing, right? This is what we do. Uh, Lord, um, could you please heal my friend, please? But only if it's your will, because I don't want to make you mad. And only if you really, really want to. And it's okay if you don't, because I understand that too, and I don't want to put her or him in a particular situation. But please, could you? I prayed the rosary. I've been to Mass. I've done all that stuff. Please, Lord, if it's your will, please. But don't be mad at me. <laughs> That's how we often pray. But if you look at the lives of the disciples and how Jesus taught them how to pray, it's much different. Look at Acts of the Apostles. In Acts of the Apostles, every miracle of healing that occurs in Acts of the Apostles occurs because of a prayer of command or a declaration of what God is going to do. Think about Peter when he sees the crippled beggar right on his way to the temple. right? He, he looks down, and the, the person's begging, and he says, silver and gold I don't have. But what I do have to give you, I give you. Get up off your pallet and walk. Imagine seeing a friend in a wheelchair and just saying, you know what? Get up off your pallet and walk in Jesus' name. That is a profoundly bold statement. But that's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And so when I pray with people for healing, I place my hand on wherever they need healing, if it's appropriate. If not, their shoulder's fine. 
right? And I basically pray this way, you know, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the gift of my sister. And I thank you, Lord, for the gift you have given us in our bodies. And you have designed them to do amazing things. And I ask you, Father, to release your healing presence and power in my sister's body right now. And I speak specifically to the knee in the name of Jesus Christ. I command this knee and all ligaments and all connective tissues to be healed now in the name of Jesus. Any pain, leave immediately. And any remaining dysfunction, just cease to, be, uh, to cease to exist in Jesus' name. And we command this need to experience full healing. And I thank you, Father, for what you're doing right now in the knee and the life of my sister. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. And if that sounds crazy, I want, you to, I want you to know right now that is a prayer of a son or a daughter. That is a prayer of someone who is confident in the goodness of their father. I'm not perfect at praying, and sometimes I mess up a lot. But when we pray, let's pray that way. We're not commanding God to heal. You understand? Nowhere in there did I say, Jesus, you will heal. I commanded the thing to be healed in the name of Jesus. And I want to recall Philippians chapter 2. Right? At the name of Jesus, every knee must bend in the heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's power in the name of Jesus. So we prayed for her knee. We placed our hand on her knee. Has anyone here ever been to a chiropractor? Raise your hands. Awesome. Is anyone here a chiropractor? Because that'll change how I tell the story. <laughs> no? Okay, you ever go to the chiropractor and they, they have your neck in that death grip, right? But it begins nice, right? They're just moving your head left to right, talking to you. How was your weekend? What did you do? Yeah, yeah, we got out. We went out with our kids too. Yeah, that was really great. <laughs> You know, that sound, right? By the way, in chiropractic, they call that full cavitation, right? That's what it's called. It's a release of gases right from the joint, that crack. Well, we're praying for this young woman's knee, and all of a sudden we hear, and her kneecap shifts underneath us. And I'm a little freaked out. I don't want to let on. But then this young woman goes, what was that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> she says, am I healed? I'm like, I don't know. I said, but it's your left knee, so why don't you stand? So she stands, and she's like, wow, there's no pain. Do you think God healed me? And I'm like, I don't know. But why don't you stand on one leg? And so she stood on one leg. She goes, there's no pain. Do you think God healed me? And I'm like, honestly, don't know. But if it's your left knee and you're standing on it, your left leg, why don't you do a deep knee bend and see what happens? Now, as soon as I said those words, I wanted to shove them back in my mouth. Because if I... If the Lord didn't heal this young woman's knee, this was going to be the most expensive dinner I was ever going to have in my life because her kneecap would fall apart. I'd have to pick up the pieces, take her to the hospital, and pay for her surgeries. God in his goodness brought complete healing. Not only did he heal the meniscus in her knee, but he strengthened and stabilized all of the muscle and the connective tissue around the kneecap. Right? But God wasn't done. And but by the way, if that sounds crazy to you, you believe that bread, something becomes someone. And when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, guess what he does in our very souls? He brings us to healing. But God wasn't done with this young woman. And I just looked at her because I could just sense the love of the Father, the invitation that the Father had for her. And I said, listen, what God has done for your knee, he wants to do for your entire life, if you'll let him. That he's ordained in this time and in this place that you would experience his love in a way that you couldn't deny because he's crazy about you. He delights in you and he, he desires, if we can say God desires, he desires that you would know him in an ever deeper level. And so do you want to give your life to the one who has given everything for you? And she said, yes. And I freaked out because I'm Catholic. <laughs> I'm like, what do I do? So I prayed. She's already been baptized. We prayed. And the Lord was incredibly generous. He was so beautiful in that moment. And when we were finished praying, she had tears in her eyes. She threw her arms around us. And she said, thank you. And then she said, what do I do next? What do I have to do next? I said, now you have to go back to church. I said, so if you're comfortable, go back to the, the community where you were raised. But if you're not comfortable going there, go to St. Anne's Parish in Capel. We're going to be there. I'm going to be there all week. Kurt's always there. We'd love to walk with you. There are people there who want to, who want to just be with you on this journey. And then we gave, her, we gave her a really big tip because it would be weird to tell somebody about the generosity of God and then stiff them on the tip. <laughs> and then we walked out. Now, 
Did God need people with particular openness or particular gifts in that moment to be his representatives? Maybe. But now, what that young woman needs is the love and the gifts and the presence of the entire Christian community. She needs men and women of wisdom to help her navigate the relationship with her father. She needs people who can teach her, who can root her in the truth. She needs men and women who are going to invest in her, walk alongside of her, pray for her. And that's what it means to live uh, as a community in this identity as a beloved son or daughter of God. God desires that we would live in this freedom and fullness even in the midst of the brokenness of life. Every time I look at my own disability, I recall the goodness of God. He didn't heal the disability, but he changed everything else. And that's what it means to be a wounded healer. That's what it means to be a sinner who knows the love of the Father. To live in that tension between the fact that we're not perfect, and yet Jesus is calling us to live in the reality of the kingdom of God. And that he loves us even if we can't figure this out on our own. And so, brothers and sisters, I just have some homework for you as we end this night of the mission. I want you to begin tonight and through tomorrow to pray and ask the Lord to reveal to you what are those places in your life that resist the love of the Father? What are the obstacles that you have to receiving the love of God? And I'll tell you what, God is incredibly generous when we pray this prayer. Sometimes for me, too generous, right? He likes to point that out. But he wants us to surrender these things. And so why am I asking you to do this? Because we're on a journey. And on Wednesday, after I share my own story, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of surrender to the Lord. We're going to take that junk and we're going to give it to him. And then we're going to see what he does in return, in his generosity and goodness. And so pray and think about what is it that is, that is resisting the love of the Father in your life or keeps you from receiving it. And second, I want you to pray and ask the Lord to show you someone in your life that you know that needs the healing touch of the Father, that needs the love of Jesus. And I want you to invite them. Catholics are not always so great at inviting people to things, unless it's like a St. Patrick's dinner or something like that. Then we're okay. But I want you to invite them to come. I will, I will speak at a parish mission if nobody's there. I honestly will. But there's no reason why this church shouldn't be filled because God's generosity will never be exhausted. And so just invite them. So those two things, does that make sense? Your homework for tonight? And just know I'm going to be praying for you tonight and I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Together we're going to, we're going to walk this journey and we're, I, I can promise you because I'm not the one who's going to deliver on this promise. The Lord God will be present to us and he will surprise us with his goodness on this journey. Amen? Let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good and gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the love which you have created us with and, and created us for. And Father, I just thank you for the delight, for the care, for the tenderness, for the generosity that you show to us. And I ask, Lord, that you would release within us now more and more of your Holy Spirit that we might desire more and more of that love, that we might desire to come to union with you ever more deeply. Bless each and every person here. Bless their friends. Bless their families, Lord. And may this parish, St. Vincent de Paul, be a light in, in the Cape. May it be a light to all those who are suffering. And may we release your goodness into the world. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. You have survived the first night of the mission. <laughs>I mean, we're professionals, but I don't know if we talked about this, Father Rick. Should they just go? Yeah. All right, just get out. He says, God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow. Originally from New York. Where? Amsterdam. Yeah, well, I, I
Yes. Yes.